Steve Lowell, welcome to the show. Welcome to <laughs> Become Your Own Superhero. Well, thanks so much, Levin. It's great to be here. Well, it's lovely to have you here, Steve. And this is a very fresh friendship that has been evolved through the wonderful connection that is Michelle Abraham and the work that she's doing. But Steve, if you were to, if you were accosted in a supermarket and someone held a gun to your head and they said, in 20 words or less, what is it that you do? What would be your response? I would say that I help experts, speakers, and coaches stand out in their market by changing the way they speak. And the fact that you had a gun to your face uh, is remarkable that you can deliver that. <laughs> such... well, I live in Canada. That kind of stuff happens to me every week. <laughs> <if you can> imagine. <laughs> and why is it that you do that, Steve? Oh, you know, this is a huge question, Lehman. I was... I get asked for the big why all the time. And I, you know, I keep going through my mind about what the answer should be. And I know the answer should be because I want to help people and, you know, because I want to help people share their stories and be successful. And all of that is true. But when I boil down to the real reason I do it, there are two. One is because I love it. And two is because I'm good at it. And those are the sort of the, the that's the bottom line is the why I do it. I do have, you know, the big, altruistic sort of uh, vision, but the reality is I do it because I love it and because I can. Well, what is the altruistic vision for you? Well, you know, I've always believed this. I've always believed that um, everybody has a message or a story or an expertise or wisdom or, or they're compelled to bring something to the world. At least most entrepreneurs, you know, like, like you and I, speakers, coaches, trainers, authors, consultants, we, we want to bring something to the world. And, and so many of these stories and so much of this wisdom will go untold and unshared because they don't know how to express it well. And it's more than just standing in front of a live or virtual audience and you know speaking and using PowerPoint. It's about taking this message that's important to us and helping the world understand and feel about our message the way we feel about our message. And so I, I truly believe that most stories will go untold, most messages unshared, most wisdom will go unexpressed because people simply don't have the skills or the confidence that they need to express it in a way that can be effectively received by those they were meant to influence. Yeah, it's brilliant because do you know the number of people that say to me, oh, you've, you've been blessed with the gift of the gab not knowing that I've spent three years working my tail off trying to learn how to use my voice as an instrument. And yeah. what is the significance of knowing that you can learn how to be an effective communicator to you? Well, I think it opens doors. And, you know, I've had many people come to me, as I'm sure you have, um, Laban, they come in and, and when they learn how to express what they're really thinking and what they're really feeling, Oftentimes they are surprised and they, they kind of go, I, I never knew I could do that. And now it opens up all the doors for them. And now they become more creative in how to share and where to share and whom to share with. And this just widens their entire perspective on what they can accomplish. Yeah, brilliant. I, uh, my story is conquering drugs and alcohol and gambling and philandering and limiting beliefs and all that other malarkey, right? Mm. What's your story? Well, I started off at the age of six, being in front of an audience playing guitar. You know, I was one of those little uh, geeky guitar guys. And I started playing in front of an audience at six. And then when I was, by the time I was a teenager, I had my own band and I was the front man and we were traveling the country and, 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 and it was a great life. But, you know, in, in the music business, as you may know, there are basically two camps. There's the camp that eats hot dogs and there's the camp that eats steak. I was in the hot dog camp and steak was nowhere in sight, <laughs> right? So I knew I had very limited ability and future in that business. And then I was about maybe 18 or 19, and I stumbled across a videotape by Zig Ziglar. And I had never heard of the man. I had never heard of the concept of getting on a platform and speaking. And I thought, wow, this guy, he's on this stage. He's got no equipment to lug around. He, his audience isn't drunk. Uh, you know, they're actual people and, and he's being paid to do this. Uh, what a great job. And so I started to investigate that. And I, I took some training about how to speak effectively. I was always a good speaker because I was always the front man in the band, but I wanted to do it professionally. And then 
over time, what happened was I became a professional speaker and I, and I found out that I have a gift. Um, my gift is not speaking. I'm an okay speaker. But my gift is reaching inside of somebody else and pulling magic out of them that they never knew existed and turning them into speakers. And so I've spent my career over the last 30, almost 35 years doing that, helping experts and coaches and authors bring their message to life in a way that actually gets past their audience's intellect and into their imagination. What are some basic techniques for someone that's starting from scratch that they can implement that's going to help them? You know, there's, there's a lot of different things that come into play with that kind of question. And I don't think that there's a one size fits all because when I speak to somebody and I, I see what they're trying to accomplish, there are different things that will come out for them than might come out for somebody else. But if I had to identify a common element, I would say that it's learn how to release because the one thing that I see most often is that people contain their emotions. They contain what they really want to express and they either contain it or they package it up in artistry and theater. And somebody has taught them, you know, how to be artistic and how to be theatrical and, and, so I try and remove all of those things. And so I think the most important thing is, you know, be, be comfortable just being yourself, whatever that is, and then learn how to deploy the artistry and the theater and all those things selectively and tactically, because we do need them, as you know. But most people that I meet really struggle with just actually being themselves. And, you know, we hear the word authentic a lot. And I don't really think that uh, authenticity is the word. And the reason I don't think it is, is because I'm not always authentic in front of an audience. I'll, and I'll give you an example. You know, I had uh, 10 years ago or so, I had a motorcycle accident, you know, nothing huge, but I fractured three of my ribs. The next day I had to stand in front of an audience and speak. And if I was being authentic, I would have been draggy and I would have said to them, I don't want to be here. I'm on drugs. I feel crap. I want to go to bed. You know, I just don't want to be here. That would have been me authentic. But, you know, we put on our authentic expression for the passion of our craft. And so we release that. And part of that means being able to just release that which is your authentic passion for your message at the time when you speak. So that would be the first thing. Give yourself permission to be you at all times in front of the audience. I see so many, and it's great advice, Steve. I appreciate that. I see so many speakers and maybe I did it at one point trying to emulate other speakers. Mm. And I, and I see the sons of really successful speakers and it's, there's like a, uh, a disingenuous maybe is the word. And it's, have you got any examples of really successful motivational speakers whose sons have gone on into their own authentic self? Can you think of anyone on the top of your head to put you on the spot here? Yeah, uh, there is one possibly um, that that I recall. And you know who T. Harv Eker is probably, and he's a big financial speaker. And never heard uh, of him. We, <laughs> Sorry. We had do you know, do you know T. I Harv never, Eker? I never never heard, well, I, I don't recognize the name. I might have said him okay, speak, but okay. I Okay, so in, in the, you know, in the financial space, he's a, he's a really big deal, and he's been around a long time. And we had one of his uh, sons, I don't know if it's his only son or not, uh, Jesse Ecker on one of our, uh, one of our events one time. And, um, and he was very good. He, he did very, very well. And I think he's off on a very great direction. Um, and he's not trying to emulate, you know, his father. And, and, and there is another one, um, you know, we have, uh, we're good friends with uh, Brian Tracy. And uh, we've had him speak at some of our events. And of course, he's a, he's a big guru. And his son is also uh, online and now speaking. And, and he has his own personality as well. So uh, there, you know, it's a good question. And I've never actually pondered it before. But now that you're asking it, I think that there are some that are extending into their father's footsteps without actually trying to be their father, you know? Yeah, because I, I, the reason I think, I think like this is I... Like when I, I, I'm not a father yet, Anna and I have had some misfire. We've had 15 consecutive miscarriages, Steve. So we're, mm. we're, we're getting to the root cause of it. And when, when we eventually solve that and I get to be a father, because of all the ad adversity that I've had to overcome, I'm well-versed on how I'm going to raise these kids. I'm going gonna, gonna to try to figure out a way so that they can experience 
natural levels of adversity whilst not being negatively affected by the the trauma component, right? I realize mm. that'll happen, but I don't think they'll ever experience within my control the levels of turmoil that I experienced. I wouldn't do that to my kids, right? Right. And I think there's that the refining of your character that you experience going through that transformative experience that gives you that ability to be an effective communicator in that fashion. And maybe there's a way of doing it where the kids can step into their own greatness. I don't know. I'm sort of thinking on this on the fly, but I think if you can figure what that out, what, what that is, it'll be a very powerful tool for other people to utilize as well. Well, it certainly is in alignment with the theme of, of your show. I mean, you know, if we want to be our own superhero, then we need to find those things within us that make us the superhero and not be something that just emulates somebody else. But, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, because when I first started speaking, you know, professionally, when I was 18 or 19, I did emulate Zig Ziglar, which was very odd because he was my only point of reference. I'm Canadian. He's from Yazoo City, Mississippi. Right. And so I would get on these stages and I would tell his jokes and his accent. And I, I mean, and people would look at me and say, what are you doing, you know, and it, uh, I'll tell you, it took me a lot of years to find who I was really. And, and as I learned about other professional speakers and, and learn, you know, from other heroes, I took pieces of each and put them together that I liked and discarded things that, that didn't fit. And over time, I, I believe I sort of created the Steve Lowell sort of, um, you know, personality. And, and I think it's important. And, and I love this whole thing about being your own superhero, because that to do that, I believe we need to look within ourselves and we need to draw out the best of ourselves and bring that forth and leverage those skills and leverage that personality and those characteristics. Yeah, well, you've nailed it pretty spot on, I think. And be yourself because everyone else is taken is one of the most famous quotes in existence, I think. And it's so true. Like it, Step into your greatness because energetically people will resonate with you in a way that only they can resonate with you. And it won't happen if, you, if you're doing impressions, which I love to do. I love to do impressions. And when I did my audio book, I uh, do a, a mean Beatles impression and uh, a few other like Eastern European voices, a few other things. But um, do you have any speaking talents? Can you do any impressions, Steve? No, I don't really do any impressions. No. <laughs> You, uh, you can do a the professional speaker from Ottawa pretty well. <laughs> I can do the professional speaker from Ottawa, you know. Um, you know, I, I used to do Zig Ziglar just because, you know, but I, I just found that people... I don't know. It's just, it's not really, if I do it within a joke or something, if I'm quoting Zig. So for example, I tell a story where um, when I first, uh, you know, was listening to Zig Ziglar, I was sitting in my car and I was, I was having a pity party. Right. And uh, because I had started, I wasn't making any money in playing music. And so I'd started selling vacuum cleaners and I was sitting in my car. It was February in Canada, which is like, you know, minus a billion. Uh, and I'm in my car and I'm freezing and I'm having this pity party. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I suck at this job. I hate this job. I'll never sell any of these stupid vacuum cleaners. I'm not good at this. So I was having this little pity party and I put, I put a cassette tape. That's how long ago this was, <laughs> we had cassette tapes. I put the cassette tape in and it was Zig Ziglar and his voice comes on and he says these words. He says, you cannot consistently perform in a manner which is inconsistent with the way you see yourself. And I'd heard those words, I'd never heard those words before. So, uh, you know, I uh, rewound it, listened to it again. And then I thought, well, how do I see myself? I suck at this job. I hate this job. I'll never be any good at this job. And so, you know, he gave this 30 day program to change the uh, self image. And I followed that. And, and then I became, you know, a national champion in, the, in that business. And, and that's how he affected me. So every now and then, when I quote Zig Ziglar, I will quote that. I think he's probably the only one that I can do even half well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh you can you can get whatever you want in life as long as you help enough other people i think i sound like someone out of the beverly hillbillies or something like no that. you're yeah, a little bit <laughs> he's kind of a cross between zig ziglar and jed clapping you're kind of in there somewhere. Yeah. um it is a lot of fun using your voice as an instrument because i in you know some of the feedback my book came out late last year Stephen, and i was 
blessed to have it endorsed and Les Brown wrote the forward for it and a number of other amazing people have endorsed it and feedback I'm getting especially from the audio book is how powerful it is because I had a lot of fun doing the audio book and I, I was not a trained voice artist beforehand my father is a retired radio announcer so I did definitely pick up some genetic throwback from that which I'm very blessed for but it, it really highlighted to me the importance of storytelling and and that statement, you know, that people don't remember what you say, what you do, they remember how you make them feel. And, and how has that impacted your life to this point? Oh, I mean, uh, hugely. Um, it's impacted where I am, who I've become, and it's impacted how I work with others. You know, um, I always say to I mean, one of the big premises of the work that I do um, is about this. It's about speaking is not a transference of information. Speaking is about a transference of emotion. And what that means is if I can make you feel about my message the way I feel about my message, now we have true communication. And if that doesn't occur, then I just might, you know, may as well send you my PowerPoint slides. You can take them to the bathroom and read them, you know, and, and you'll get all, all the same value. Now, that doesn't mean we don't use information when we speak. We do. We, you know, we educate and we inform and we do those things. But for the, for the most part, um, if we are speaking as a speaker and not a teacher or a trainer, if we're a speaker, our job is to affect change at the emotional level, at the, um, you know, at, at the intrinsic level and get past the imagination uh, or get past the intellect and into the imagination and affect change. And generally, change happens from the root of emotion, and then it is validated with the intellect. So you're right, you know, we, we need to affect that emotion. And if we don't, then really, why were we there? So we need to change as speakers, you know, um, uh, Laban, I, I believe that we need to do more than just speak. We need to change people's perspectives. We need to rattle their beliefs. We need to reset their expectations. We need to, you know, shake their paradigms a little bit so that they are, they become more than they were when they walked in and sat down. And, and that should be a big part of our, our objective as speakers. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I you know, a number of people that, that listen and watch the show, Steve, uh, in the coaching and speaking space and, and in your role as the president for the, the Canadian, what's the acronym short for Canadian? CAPS. I'm, the, I'm a past president of the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, CAPS. Which is like the NSA in the US and, and PSA in Australia and a number of yeah. other professional speaking. It's, a, it's like the premier speaking organization for your, for your country, right? Yeah. So... A lot of questions I get are, how do I get booked as a speaker? Like, what are the attributes that people are looking for? Um, and I know this isn't specifically your skill set, but you're around the game long enough to know how it works. What are some advice you can give for some up and coming people for this, for this particular subject? Yeah, I know this sounds uh, pretty lame, but the first thing is be good. You can't be, you can't be booked if you're not good. Um, and, you know, I see so many speakers and I know you do too. Laban, they get on the platform uh, and they're just not good. And so there are four elements that, that I believe people need to have in their, in their speaking package in order to make them bookable. And one of them is skill. Now, I'm not just talking about being slick and smooth, and, and, and that's secondary or, or lower. I mean, it never hurts to be slick and smooth. That, that's okay. But I'm talking about the skills that, that you personally require in order to get what's in your heart and in your mind and in your gut out into the audience's mind, into their hearts and into their guts. And, and there are different sets of skills required to do that. And the required skills may differ from one speaker to the next. So the skill is the first thing. You need to know what it takes for you as an individual to get that message through their, you know, past their intellect into their imagination. The second one is structure. And and, you know, there are all kinds of, um, you know, templates and all kinds of systems for how you could, how you're supposed to construct a speech and all those things. And what I tell people is structure your presentation tactically so that it brings you to the desired outcome of your presentation. And so, you know, don't worry too much about, you know, the opening up a certain way or closing with a call to action and, you know, three points and then three, uh, three points of evidence. All of that's fine, but that's not the structure I'm talking about. I'm talking about a structure that is tactically and strategically designed to get you to bring your audience to a, a certain point. Um, and that may mean you need to study NLP a little bit. You may need to study, uh, you know, neuroscience a little bit. You may need to study audience engagement a little bit. So the structure needs to be 
be tactical. And then the third thing is substance. And this is the one I see missed the most. Um, you know, if when I go and when I hear a speaker teaching me something that I could just Google on, you know, I can do a Google search in three seconds and get the information, then that's a waste of time for me and that speaker. You need to have substance that, that, that shakes their paradigms, that changes their perspective. Like I said, you know, it rattles their beliefs. It makes them think, uh, makes them, you know, reconsider the nature of their condition. And that's what substance does. Those three things, if we have them strongly, are going to make us bookable. And then the fourth one for many any of us uh, is a sales process. How do we monetize these presentations beyond the speaking fee? Because, you know, as, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, Laban, or maybe you'll agree, maybe you won't, but the whole speaking for a fee thing still exists and you can still do it, but it's becoming more and more difficult and less and less popular in the speaking world. So we need to learn how to monetize as coaches, speakers, experts, and consultants and use speaking to drive revenue. So once we have that package in place with those four things, then what happens is, you know, we need to become more visible and we, and, and it's not about chasing speaking gigs because every, everybody who can fog a mirror now claims to be a speaker and they're all chasing speaking gigs, right? So yeah, pursue speaking gigs and respond to RFPs and all of those things, but become visible, do this, get on podcasts, let people hear your message, you know, and be active on social media, which I, you know, I'm elevating now. And here's the thing. Once you do get booked to speak, if the right people are in the room and eventually they will be, then the speaking gigs will find you and you don't need to find them as much. But, you know, I hear, I meet so many people say, look, Steve, you know, I've got this amazing experience and I've written the book and now I need speaking gigs. Where do I find them? Uh, and then I, I, I interview them or I watch them speak, watch a video. And I think, you know, you're not ready. You're not ready for the speaking gigs you're looking for. So here's what, what I did, and here's what some people still do, and I know this is still a great way to do it, is look for um, service organized, service clubs, you know, Kiwanis Club, Lions Clubs, Rotary Clubs. They are always looking for speakers. They're not paid, but some key people are in those audiences. It's a great way to get in front of an audience. It's a great way to cut your teeth. It's a great way to build your skills and establish a brand and establish some connection equity, and then the gigs start to come. Yeah, brilliant advice. And I think the whole point about being good is learning, becoming consciously incompetent about what blocks that you bring into your speaking. And, I, and the thing about being, we're, we're in Melbourne for most of the lockdown, Stephen, and I was able to do one in-person event in two years, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, the, the podcast really helped me refine the pace and my, ability to listen and a number of other amazing things. Right. And I, and I really enjoyed the learning, learning process, but becoming, and I did speaker training with a guy called Vin Jang, who hopefully you've heard mm -hmm. of him before. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. I, now I think he's, he's easily one of the best in the business. Right? Oh yeah. From a technical, he's someone V I N H G I A N G, right. He's Vietnamese first generation Australian, amazing guy, magician, and his speaker training course was really powerful for me. And it's really helped me take people not so deep that I can't lift them out of the emotional turmoil because mm -hmm. some of the stuff I talk about is pretty heavy. But mm -hmm. I've learned to clear out the ums and the ahs more so and be at peace with silence. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, like <laughs> and uh, what a difference it's made in my ability to communicate. So I've still got lots of work to do. But I'm sharing a stage with Les Brown, Waldo Waldman, Tom Ziegler, you know, um, maybe Ron DeSantis in, in September. And this will be one of my first in-person speaking <laughs> engagements. Yeah, no pressure, brother. <laughs> no pressure. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I respect the opportunity. And this mm -hmm. came to me organically. Someone approached me and... Don't you worry, Stevie boy. I'm going to execute the mother flipper out of this, right? I'm I know you will. I know you will, brother. <laughs> because, because it's going to be recorded, right? And then I'm going to have a sizzle reel of all sizzle reels. Mm -hmm. Why is that important in the speaker journey? The sizzle reel? Yeah. Well, the sizzle reel is, is important for many reasons. I mean, obviously, so that potential, um, you know, potential bookers can see you, potential event planners can see you, potential clients can see you. But it's also important for the audience because the audience knows you're going to be there. They're going to check out, many of them are going to check out your sizzle reel and it sets the expectations. 
And this is the thing. The scissor reel is going to set the expectations for what your organizers and what your audience can expect. Now you've set the bar for yourself. And it puts a challenge upon you now because you have to exceed the expectation every single time. So that sizzle reel sets the bar for what your expected performance is going to be. And so everybody who's watched that now is going to come with a predetermined expectation of what the experience of you is actually going to be. So now it puts you under, not pressure, but it puts you under an obligation to deliver beyond the expectation because you know, we don't deliver what we say. We deliver far more than what we say, and we don't deliver what they expect. We deliver far more than what they expect. And that's almost a requirement now. And, and the expectation is over delivery. So that's the sizzle reel. It sets the bar, sets the expectation, challenges you to keep on your game and keep elevating your game. Yeah. I, I an analogy I came up with yesterday when I was talking to someone else about something similar was it's, it's amazing going to a concert and or a festival and then you, you stumble across some band you've never heard, heard of before and you're like, wow, that was amazing. But I think it's always cooler when you're watching the Rolling Stones or and you're singing along, you know, the Strokes or whoever is your favorite band and you've had some experience with them leading up to that point. It's built that, that familiarity. And I think that's, that's what is really important with people knowing you and having an opportunity to learn more about you. Right. Uh, that's just my, my analogy. And it's something that came to me yesterday, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I so, agree. So Steve, you, you've got a lovely wife. You've been married for how many years now? Jane and I have been married for uh, coming up on four years. We've been together for eight. Congratulations. And what does your lovely wife do with herself? Oh, Jane and I are partners in the business. So Jane um, ran her own business for 25 years and she was very, very successful. And, um, and she retired from that business in 2010. And then we met, I think in 2014. And so um, we work in the business together. So she does coaching as well. She does mindset uh, coaching. She has a program and she calls the seven figure mindset um, system. She's known around the world as the seven figure mindset mentor. And she takes care of the business end of our, our business. So we always, when we were traveling and when we will be again, we always travel together. Uh, we work together. Uh, I'm in my studio here. She's in her office in another part of the house. And my office is upstairs. And, um, and so we do everything together. So she helps me with my content. She's my, you know, she's the, the backboard that I, I bounce everything off of. Uh, we guide each other. So she and I are like this in the business. I love because Anna and I, uh, she's finally stepped away from her corporate job and stepping into her greatness and she's doing amazing things. And it's, uh, it's so much fun working together as like a spouse um, yeah. when you're aligned on the same stuff and being there for each other and going through the, you know, the emotional uh, roller coaster that being an entrepreneur in the current world is. Yeah. But I want to know more about what it is that you two are creating together. What is it that you are bringing to the world that's going to improve the world? So there's a couple of things that that have come out of the uh, sort of out of the proverbial woodwork over the whole pandemic thing. And that is, We've got several niches that we work with. One niche is with, um, with un, uh, nonfiction authors, because we find that so many nonfiction authors, they write their book and then they don't know what to do with it. And then they wonder why the, you know, they didn't sell a million copies. So we're doing work with, with them. We're doing a, a, still a lot of work with speakers because I've been working with speakers for 35 years. And so I, I do a lot of work with speakers to bring them up to the professional and the elite level on the platform. And we work with, uh, with coaches because so many coaches now are turning to speaking and, and writing books in order to drive you know, business. And so we work a lot with coaches to help them craft and deliver their message in a way that drives, drives uh, traffic. And we also have a, uh, a big a charity component to our business. We give to a lot of foundations around, around, especially around Ottawa, a lot of hospital foundations and children's foundations. So we have a philanthropic arm to our businesses as well. And what's on the horizon for, for Steve Howell in the next 10 years? What do you want to have achieved by then? Oh, you know, I, I just want to keep doing what I do, man. I'm, you know, I don't think 10 years down the road. I mean, if I could wave a magic wand and go 10 years down the road, I, I think I'm just going to be doing what I'm doing now because it's just, it's in my soul. It's, it's not what I do. It's who I am. And I imagine I'll be the same person in 10 years from now, you know? Yeah. I think the simplicity, I got interviewed just before and they were talking about, it was the lady who interviewed me studied 
uh, and meditated in India and lived in the, she's English and lived in the Himalayas and (laughs) Nepal and stuff. And you wouldn't look, you wouldn't know it looking at her, but she was just saying some of like the simple part of her life where she just got up and made her food and there was no technology. And I just, I was like, Hmm, it sounds interesting. And I, but I, for the meantime, my priorities are, you know, I've got some, a lot more impact I need to have on the world before I make that, that, that transition. But where can people find you, Steve? Uh, at my website is the easiest place, stevelowell.com, L-O-W-E-L-L, Steve Low, uh, stevelowell.com. Everything is there. Um, a little bit of poking around, you'll find my books and courses and events and all of those things. But that's the best place to, uh, to find me. And I'm on all the social media channels on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, all of those. So just do a search for me and you'll find me. And if people had to pick one of your many books, which one would you recommend they read first? Well, it depends on their on their journey. So there are there are two. If they're just breaking into the speaking world, then from stage fright to spotlight would be one that's available on Amazon. Ninety nine speaker secrets to breaking the rules and mastering the stage. Um, but if they're working on standing out about from their competition and crafting a unique message, the most uh, recent book is called Deep Thought Strategy. Um, and this is about how to craft a message a very unique and powerful way so that you stand out among those who do what you do. Those are the, the two that I would recommend. Yeah, brilliant. So in Steve, Steve's background, I mean, pedigree, pedigree, pedigree is really the only way to describe and you've had access to the best in the Canadian business and and internationally just through the nature of the work that you do. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it's so important, I think, that people realize that each and every single one of us have a, have an, a message to, to share. Most people won't. Most people, mm-hmm. it'll die inside them. And I didn't finish school. I never went to college. Who am I to declare myself the world's best courage coach? Well, how would the world's best courage coach conduct himself? And I'm able to impact people's lives by taking the time and effort to learn how to use my voice as an instrument and surround myself with people like Steve uh, to help level me up because we become like the five people we spend the most time around. Steve, this has been really helpful and insightful. I know people get tremendous value from this and we appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge. Well, some of your knowledge, a lot more that's available. Do you have any concluding thoughts for our audience? Yep. I think if I was to offer a concluding thought, it would be this. I'm going to quote somebody. I'm going to quote um, uh, Garth Brooks, major music star. And in one of his songs called The River, there's a quote in that song that uh, struck me the moment I heard it and I live my life by it and I share it all the time. And this is the quote. It says, don't you sit upon the shorelines and say you're satisfied. Choose to chance the rapids and dare to dance the tide. That's my closing quote for your audience. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Lowell.